Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Geotox Express webinar. Um, we're happy to see so many of you here to learn about some of the new features in Global Mapper Standard version 25.0. This is a new version of Global Mapper. It was released just yesterday, so it's brand new. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to download it and explore it on your own, I definitely encourage you to do that, um, especially after seeing some of these new features and improvements that we have um, today. So my name is Mackenzie Mills. I'm an associate product manager here at Blue Marble Geographics. And today I'm joined by Jeff Hatzel, um, a product manager on Global Mapper. How are you today, Jeff? Hi, Mackenzie. I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to talk a little bit about Global Mapper and uh, show off what's new in Global Mapper standard here. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> yeah. So before we get started into some of the demos that we have planned, talking about some new features specifically, we have some general housekeeping to go over as usual with these webinars. Um, just some notes on the webinar format. Um, for those of you who have attended a Geotox Express webinar with us before, you will know that attendees are in listen-only mode. So hopefully you are able to hear Jeff and myself, but we cannot hear you um, if you're, you know, trying to talk to us. Um, we do have a questions panel and you should see that built into the GoToWebinar interface where you can type some questions as you have them and we definitely encourage that um, if you have questions as we're going along through this content. And lastly, this session is being recorded so you will receive an email um, after this session with the recorded version of it, probably a couple days after this. Um, so you can you know, review or share um, this webinar if you would like. As far as what we have coming up for additional webinars, we're through the end of the year here. We've got um, next week, actually, October 4th, Jeff and I will be back to talk about what's new in Global Mapper Pro version 25. So Global Mapper Pro is the suite of advanced tools that expand the functionality of Global Mapper Standard, and we'll talk about some of the changes that you may see in the program um, with the Pro tools for version 25. Coming up in November, uh, we will have a geographic calculator release, our other product line here at Blue Marble Geographics, and we will talk about um, and host a webinar, you know, going over geographic calculator, what it is for those of you who may not know, who may be global mapper users exclusively, um, and talking about some new features available in the new release of that product as well. If you have any, if you want more information, read some more descriptions about these webinars or register for them so you get some reminder emails and can, you know, remember to attend or watch the recording afterwards, visit our website, um, bluemarblegeo.com slash geotox express webinars. That link is on screen here. And sort of the last in our housekeeping section uh, is our upcoming training sessions. So we have some online training sessions hosted through a platform similar to this, but does allow um, attendees of the class to, to speak to the instructor, instructors. These are instructor-led sessions where we're going to guide you through some workflows so you can you know, get the most out of Global Mapper. Um, Online training sessions, we have some coming up in October. They are generally split into global mapper training and then a special session specifically on LIDAR processing. So working with point clouds and all the tools in global mapper standard and pro associated with working with that type of data. So we have sessions for that coming up in October and November. Um, I have all of that information on screen here, but you can also, of course, visit our website for more information to you know, go over the agenda, what we'll be doing in the class, um, and sign up for those classes if you are interested. Additionally, uh, we do have an in-person training session um, coming up in Denver. So that'll be in person, live with an instructor in a physical classroom. Um, and that will be middle of November for a few days, again, going over the global mapper training and then uh, days specifically dedicated to LIDAR processing. Um, we also have some introductory self-training just to get to know global mapper. 
um, available at training.bluemarblegeo.com. So we encourage you to check that out, especially if you are you know, not too familiar with just the general workings of Global Mapper and you just want to go over some of the basics there. So with all of that information to start off, we'll get into the agenda for this webinar, um, where we're going to go over what's new in Global Mapper Standard version 25. We've got some great new features and improvements to the program here. Um, we're going to start off talking a little bit about the high resolution display. Um, we are aware that this is not going to maybe share quite as well or as obviously over a, a webinar platform um, such as GoToWebinar, but if you are working with high resolution 4K displays, you'll definitely see some improvements with that display um, in Global Mapper 25. We'll be looking at some new and split up menus just to make some tools more accessible in Global Mapper. We'll take a look at some auto styling options um, that are available in the, pro in the new version of the program. And then moving into some analysis, looking at an improvement to the watershed analysis tool where 3D vector features will be considered and then um, some terrain editing and creation um, improving the flattened site plan creation tool, allowing you to further optimize the placement of a flattened site plan. Finally, at the end of the session, we will go over how to upgrade to Global Mapper version 25. This is a question we get quite frequently, um, and so we just want to make sure that, that everyone is aware how to get the latest version if they are interested in doing so. So with that quick overview of what we're going to talk about um, in the next little bit here, I think I'll hand the screen over to Jeff to start us off with some notes about the high resolution display. Great, thanks Mackenzie. Let me go ahead and grab the screen here. Um, so as Mac was saying, you know, we were talking about this earlier and realized that our you know, video streams are capped, probably not even at 1080p. So you may not see super clearly here what we're talking about, but as you get into the application, um, you'll see that one of the things we focused on recently was uh, allowing the app to be a little more adaptive across a variety of display types. You know, these days, so many of us have, you know, 2K, 4K displays in a variety of resolutions above your standard kind of full HD. Um, and there was something I was running into as well, you know, on, on my desktop and I was looking at the apps like, wow, our, you know, our text could be crisper, our, you know, windows and displays could look cleaner. And so what we went through and did was made the application um, more adaptive and dynamic to those different screen resolutions. Um, so text looks a lot clearer, things um, scale a little bit better and really just helps overall working in the application. Um, you know, your text doesn't look as blurry and things like that. And that also helps out if you're someone um, who maybe scales up your display for you know visual reasons, that'll scale up a little better and a little more clearly too. Um, so not a major thing, but really helps with just you know everyday working in the application, especially you know maybe you're moving between laptop and desktop, large monitors, etc. Um, is a, a nice little quality of life improvement there. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that, that I'll, I'll mention is going along with that was the little bit second bullet on the agenda here was um, splitting out some of our menus. So for those of you who have been with Global Mapper for a long time, um, you'll probably recall that we had one really long analysis menu and that was effectively broken into sections, um, especially with the introduction of Global Mapper Pro a few years ago and the expansion of all the Pro tools and uh, LiDAR analysis tools and things like that. These menus were getting really large and a little bit cumbersome, especially if someone is only working with, you know, a restricted type of analysis at a given time. And so what we did was we split out the analysis menus into a handful of different menus. And you'll see they're you know, uh, organized based on the type of analysis you're doing. So we have a vector analysis, terrain analysis, raster analysis, and then LiDAR related tools for the, for the pro users. Um, what you'll see here is that each, um, each menu will still retain any of the icons that it had previously. So if it has an icon on the toolbar, it's there. Um, nothing has changed in that regard. We've just split things out to make things a little bit more accessible um, and a little bit easier to find when you're 
um, maybe cruising through a workflow and you don't need to dig through all the raster analysis tools or terrain analysis tools, you know, just to get into doing something like finding duplicate features, right? So a little bit more streamlined, cleaner there and helps us um, work through the application a little bit more uh, succinctly. Yeah, I really like this change to the interface, um, especially since I'm often working on a laptop with a smaller screen and some of our, you know, general analysis menus and previous versions of Global Mapper were getting quite long to the point mm -hmm. where they would hit the bottom of the screen. So this definitely makes all the tools a little more visible and accessible um, when you're working on smaller mm -hmm. displays as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I can go ahead and grab the screen back and we'll move on to the uh, third bullet in our agenda list here and talk a bit about some auto styling um, that we have implemented in Global Mapper version 25. So this method of visualizing some vector features in Global Mapper version 25 pertains to unclassified and unknown point, line, and area or polygon feature types. So the best way to show this is to just click on the load default data button. And in previous versions of Global Mapper, um, this data would always appear gray with some darker gray um, outlines. And of course we have the labels here as well, sort of just our general world map to get some data displaying in the program. Um, now we're seeing this data in blue. If I unload this data and load it again, we'll see that auto styling kick in. Um, the feature type for these specific features, I can look at with the feature info tool, we have an unknown area type. So that's one of the two area types um, or the feature types for polygon features that are going to apply some sort of auto styling. And this is really helpful um, when you're loading in maybe a bunch of data, points, lines, and polygons that all have some sort of unknown or unclassified feature type. Um, so no style specifically associated with them. Um, they're not all just going to display in gray or black default styles like they would have in previous versions of Global Mapper. They're gonna come in with some colors applied from a palette that can be set up in configuration. Um, and we'll take a look at that in a second. And it helps just differentiate between some different layers in Global Mapper. I can show this with some other data as well. Once again, I'm just gonna unload my default data. And I have some recently opened files here, some towns in Maine. We're seeing again this yellow color as our first layer that's loaded. And as I mentioned, this works for points and line features as well. So I can go ahead and load in some line features. These are roads uh, in Maine here. We see those displaying with the pink color. Again, if I just for demonstration to unload those features, I can load in those same layers. We've got a slightly different color for our polygons and we'll see a different color here for our line features as well. Um, so changing up that styling a little bit just to differentiate some of the layers a little more clearly um, when multiple layers are loaded into a workspace. Now, a couple ways that I can go ahead and change the styling of these features. Um, of course, I can do that in the layer options. So I've just opened the layer options for my lines that I have in this workspace. Um, on the line styles tab, or maybe area styles, point styles, depending on which geometry you're looking at, we are going to see options to, of course, set a specific line style. I can set this to maybe a nice bright purple color here, apply that change, and we'll see that reflected with our loaded data in Global Mapper. That option has always been there in Global Mapper. Another option that has been in Global Mapper, but is maybe a little more relevant now that um, this auto styling has been implemented, is to assign a feature type to a layer. 
So as I mentioned, this auto styling is only applied to unknown or unclassified feature types. These lines have loaded in as an unknown line type, but I can change this to maybe a road feature type that I've created in Global Mapper. I'll hit apply and the default styling for that alternate feature type will kick in and be used to display this data. So just another method for maybe changing the visualization of features in Global Mapper here. Now, as we saw, every time I unloaded, sort of started from a blank workspace um, and loaded in the data, Global Mapper displayed these unknown layers in, um, you know, with some different colors and some different styling. That won't happen if I've saved this workspace and reopen it. Um, we can see that if I go ahead and just quickly save this workspace, I can then unload, like I'm starting with a blank Global Mapper instance here, find that saved workspace, and these feature styles will be consistent. Um, namely this orange background of the, the towns of Maine, um, these polygon features that we're looking at. Now we did just get a question about if auto styling can be disabled um, and it can through configuration. There are a lot of options in configuration relating to the different ways that, that layers are styled. Um, in this styles section, there are um, options for point styles, area styles and line styles. So this is where I've created that road class for my line features. If I come up to area styles, I believe that these features are an unknown area type. And we can see that we're using a palette file to just randomly determine what color to display this data in. And this will change, you know, as I load different layers um, that are within that unknown area type. We do have the option to change the palette. You can add, remove colors manually, you know, initialize from a built-in palette within Global Mapper here with a dropdown. Load a palette of colors that you particularly like from a file if you have that. So there are some ways to customize what colors might be randomly used to display your data. Um, but alternatively, you can just use the traditional methods and not work from a palette here. Set a specific fill pattern for area features in this case and a border style. Choose something bright here. I'll click apply. And since I have no fill and I've changed that border style to be something specific, we are going to see that reflected for our unknown area type. So now if I load another layer that has an unknown area type, it's going to use the style that I have set up specifically in configuration here um, for this feature type. So there are still ways to disable or customize the um, styling for these unclassified and unknown feature types, um, but the, the default behavior is going to be to use that auto, auto styling to help differentiate between some different layers as they're loaded into Global Mapper. We did just get another question about um, any new symbols that we've added for custom um, area point or line features, sort of any vector features here. And off the top of my head, I do not think that we've added new built-in types, but there are options in configuration under styles here to you know, create a new line type and set a specific style for that. Same with some area features, adding a new type and doing some customization there as well. Um, for point features, there is the option to add some custom symbols. So if you have a specific symbol you would like to use and see that display um, for some point features on your map, you can add some custom symbols. And then in the point styles tab, create a new type and call on a custom added symbol here. Um, so 
I don't think we've we've changed too many of the built-in types. We tend to keep those fairly standard and the same, but you can absolutely add customization to these lists of vector feature types um, and the styling that is used for them um, as you manually set that feature type for some features as they're loaded or created in Global Mapper or you know um, feature types that are pulled from an attribute. And, and Mackenzie, the, the way you were just talking about that kind of reminded me of something that I thought I would add. Um, if you're working with data that has um, a specific styling built into it, you know, there's some file formats where the styling is built into the format, um, that will not get overridden by the styling. So the app's always going to honor um, any styling that a feature may have uh, when it's loaded into the application. Um, and just going off of that question of, of the addition of styles, if there's, you know, certain things you're looking to see, you know, we always love to hear that, let us know. Um, I know certain industries and certain formats um, have certain symbols that users may want, and we're always open to adding that sort of thing. It's just a matter of letting us know about it. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of the development that we do in Global Mapper is based off of user requests and um, you know, our users are the experts in their industries. Um, so we definitely don't have all of the information. And so we do love to hear from you guys about how Global Mapper can be improved, you know, what styles you want to see and, and other improvements as well. So with that, I'll wrap up the auto styling section and move on to some of the um, improvements to analysis and terrain creation tools in Global Mapper here. So the next item on our list is uh, the ability to consider or include 3D vector features in watershed analysis. So I'm just switching workspaces here to a workspace where I've got a small area of uh, terrain, I have a point that I can start a stream from. So we're going to trace the flow from this selected blue point here. Um, we can see just looking at this terrain that it looks like there is a, a river or a stream coming through here. The other vector feature that I have in this workspace is right around the center here. It is this line feature representing a dam. So this is not something that is included in the terrain grid. I can just turn that off here in the control center. It's a vector line feature. Um, we can take a look at it with the feature information tool. It does have an elevation, although that is not a requirement for this improvement to the watershed tool. So to really get into this and see how it you know, impacts the analysis, I am going to start by making sure I have my, my point selected here, my flow from point, and I will open the create watershed tool from the analysis toolbar up at the top. I will name my created layer. So I'm not going to include vector features. So this will just be you know, not including that option. So we can do a little comparison in a moment here. I will set up my watershed creation options. I'm tracing the flow from the selected point. Um, we can see this new section down the bottom left of this dialog is to include vector data. Again, I'm not including any of that vector data for this first run of the tool. And I will click OK. Global Mapper will pretty quickly trace the flow from my start point, and we can see that it flows right through this dam because I've chosen not to include that vector feature here. I'll turn off that created set of streams, and with this same feature still selected, I'm going to perform a very similar analysis, but in this case, I'm going to include vector features namely this dam feature that I have. I'll make sure that I'm using the same watershed generation options so we have that nice direct comparison. But I'm going to enable this checkbox here to use vector features as obstructions. So this applies to any vector features that are in Global Mapper here. 
again, the watershed analysis tool is going to primarily rely on the terrain data that is loaded for the area. Um, but we now have the option to use vector features as obstructions. Vector features don't necessarily have to have an elevation value per vertex or a singular elevation values to be used um, in this analysis. Our dam feature happens to have an elevation, um, but you can choose to only consider those 3D um, vector features that do have elevation values. Um, we'll make sure that obstructions or vector features are always blocking the flow. And this is a little more applicable if you're working with maybe an area feature instead of a line feature like I'm working with in this case. Um, and this checkbox option will ensure that no flow is going to maybe begin within an area feature and be able to flow over the boundary to the outside of the feature. And then lastly, if your vector features have height value or an elevation value that is not an absolute elevation value but maybe relative to the terrain layer uh, that you're working with you can enable that option here with heights of vector features relative to ground below that we have the list of vector feature layers that are available in my workspace um, i'm just going to work with this dam line that i have here and with this I'll click OK. Global Mapper will work through creating our watershed once again. But in this case, since we chose to include that vector feature and made sure that it blocked the flow, we can see that that flow from our start point down this river terminates at the dam and a new stream is created for the second part of this below the dam or down, downstream from that. Um, so this is just another way to you know, include some obstructions in the watershed creation tool. Um, previously, methods to do this would involve doing some terrain editing and actually creating this dam feature as part of the terrain grid that is used for the watershed analysis. Um, and we sort of remove that intermediate step by just allowing you to directly incorporate vector features in this analysis process. So if there are no questions about that watershed analysis tool um, for the moment, I'll move on to our, our next bullet here, which is some improvements to the flattened site plan creation tool um, to create an optimized flattened site plan. So once again, I'm going to bring up another workspace here. I've got a 2D and 3D view open for this data. Uh, we can see this is the edge of a body of water that I've hydro flattened here. Um, I've got a property area that I can select as a vector polygon. I also have a building site feature. So I want to create a flattened area for a building to be placed on this property somewhere. I've digitized this rectangular feature and just placed it somewhere within this property boundary. Um, and we can take a look at the terrain below this feature with the path profile tool. And we can see that along this path here, the terrain is quite sloped. You know, maybe down further, a little closer to the, the water's edge, um, the, the land's a little flatter and it'll be easier to flatten out a site for a building to be placed. Now I can manually move this vector feature around find a good location for it um, and you know create the flattened site plan. That would be done with the calculate flattened site plan from selected areas tool found in the digitizer advanced feature creation options menu. Um, and the first sort of top half of this dialogue um, are existing options that have been available in previous versions of Global Mapper. 
So if I know that I want to flatten this area to a specific height, I can choose to do that here. Um, I can calculate a flattened site plan that equalizes cut and fill volumes. So that's going to work with the exact placement of this polygon building site, um, but try to equalize the cut and fill volumes. So there's a minimal amount of um, earth being taken in or, or brought in to create this flattened site. Thirdly, you can flatten to some area heights if you are again working with a 3D vector feature. The new option in this dialog um, is for some further site placement optimization. So instead of just optimizing the um, or equalizing the cut and fill volumes, this option, enabled or disabled with a checkbox here, is going to move the vector feature that I have selected um, around a little bit in order to find the optimized placement for this um, flattened area. So as we looked at with the path profile tool, currently this rectangular polygon is on the side of a gentle hill. There's probably a better spot for that flattened area somewhere within this property boundary. So I'm going to use this option to optimize placement of our site um, to minimize the cut and fill difference there. Two options uh, in this section are to search for a site within a certain radius of our existing selected polygon feature. So I can search for something, you know, within 25, 75, uh, two kilometers, whatever you know, radius you would like to try and analyze right near this drawn feature. Our other option here is to search for a site within an existing area. Um, here, selecting that second option, I have the list of available polygon layers in this workspace um, available in a dropdown. And I have this property bounds layer where I want to find the best placement for my site within this property area. So that will be the option that I choose. As I click OK here, Global Mapper is going to work through, try different offsets, moving and rotating this feature. So I'm maintaining the shape and size of the feature. Um, the site plan that I have selected, but you know, moving it around within this property boundary to try and find the best place um, to flatten an area that will minimize cut and fill volume, sort of minimize the work that needs to be done here. Um, so this, this will take a minute since Global Mapper is working through and trying some different placements and doing a, a further analysis on multiple options in order to provide you with the best option in the end. So here at the end, I have my volume calculation where I have a cut volume, a fill volume, um, and some other statistics, including our break-even height or the height of that flattened area. Clicking OK from that volume calculation window, we can see a couple new layers appear in the control center. We have our flattened site polygon here. And this is our moved or adjusted rotated site area. I'll turn off the original building site uh, that was ill-placed. And we can see the placement of this new site, again, in a little bit of a flatter area of this terrain. And then, of course, we have the actual terrain that's created there. It's a little bit hard to see um, with this shader active. But if I maybe change to a slope shader, we can see that this is a perfectly flat area um, for that optimized flattened site plan. Um, and Global Mapper has done all the work for us here. I've just decided how big an area I want to flatten, and Global Mapper found the best place for me to place that flattened site plan within the, the boundaries of this property that we have here. Um, so definitely improvement to the flatten site plan tool. Again, that tool is available from the digitizer, advanced feature creation options, um, and it relies on terrain, 
an existing terrain layer that is loaded and a selected polygon feature um, that you would like to flatten. So that wraps up um, the, the bigger or significant new features that uh, we were going over here for Global Mapper Standard version 25. There are, of course, many smaller improvements um, and, and features in the program, um, and then some bigger changes uh, in the Global Mapper Pro set of tools that we'll talk about next week. But as a final um, item on our agenda here, I will bring back up a slide and I believe Jeff is going to talk to us a little bit about how you as a user can upgrade to Global Mapper version 25 um, to make sure that you have the latest updates and available tools um, at your disposal within the program. Sure, and that actually dovetails well off of a question that somebody asked earlier. I answered that privately, um, but they were asking about if they are upgrading to the new version, what happens essentially to anything they've customized. Um, the easiest way to physically begin the update process is to download and um, install the application on the same machine. Any customized uh, settings, options, styles, things of that nature should automatically be picked up by um, the new version of the application. As long as you are in some type of active maintenance and support, have a new order from within the last year, um, <clears throat> or otherwise, or maybe on an active supported network license order, um, you should be able to. Um, download, install, and have the application register without issue. Um, you can make new purchases right on our website if you would like, or um, contacting our sales team. And Mackenzie has their email address at the bottom of the screen there. That is just orders at bluemarblegeo.com. Um, we had a couple other questions come in, Mackenzie, one of which I had to look up um, to answer. Uh, somebody asked about the the search radius for um, the placement of a optimized pad site and that is um, effectively done off the bounding box of the site rather than um, the centroid of the site and um, there'll be a little more details in our documentation if you want to read how but it's a, effectively a variant on the bounding box of the site. We did also just get a question about um, foreign language versions of Global Mapper. Um, so this, as I mentioned at the beginning, Global Mapper version 25 was just released yesterday. So it is, you know, brand new. Um, foreign language versions, you know, with the work that we have to do to, to translate everything and make sure that is correct, um, usually come a little bit after um, the English available version. Um, so those will depend on some of that translation work that we have. I don't know if we have a general timeline um, for that, but usually within a couple weeks. I don't know if you can speak to that any more specifically, Jeff. Uh, I think we had everything much closer ready to go um, later this week. Don't quote me on that, but we can touch base and follow up um, outside of, of the call with with the person who asked that question. Um, and yes, Global Mapper is only a 64-bit application. The 32-bit version of the application was discontinued back, I think, Mackenzie, with the uh, end of Windows 32-bit, is that correct? Yes, I believe that's when we, we converted to just, just building the 64-bit version mm -hmm. of the application. Um, yes. Uh, one more question that we got about water, the watershed analysis. Um, you know, I was just creating some streamlines um, in the short demonstration that I did today, but the watershed areas or catchment areas for streams um, are generated based off of the flow analysis in the watershed tool um, that goes into creating those streamlines. So yes, the you know area features will block 
the streamline from continuing, which will in turn affect the creation of the area features that are generated. Um, the area features may still overlap with some of the vector feature obstructions that you're considering in the watershed creation or analysis, um, but the flow won't continue through those features. Um, it will just be like a bounding area for the stream that um, the flow contributes to. So we appreciate all the great questions that we've gotten today. Um, if you, you know, have more questions, of course, download Global Mapper version 25 um, to explore the new version um, and some of these features for yourself. You know, working with your own data is probably the best way to fully understand and explore these new features. Um, but if you do have additional questions, um, on screen now I have our technical support email, geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. We're happy to answer any questions that you have there. And of course, you can always find more information about Global Mapper and upcoming webinars, training, and many other things on our website. Um, next week, next Wednesday, I believe at the same time, we will be going over some new and exciting features in Global Mapper Pro. So I definitely uh, encourage you to register for that webinar if you are not already and join us again next week to talk about some more great, exciting new features. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending um, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.